Cornelius Castoriadis, The Social Imaginary and the Institution, 1975. The Social Historical. Our aim in this chapter is to elucidate the question of society and that of history, questions that can be understood only when they are taken as one and the same. The question of the social historical. Inherited ways of thinking can only make fragmentary contributions to this elucidation. Perhaps this contribution is mostly negative, marking out the limits of a mode of thought and displaying its impossibility. This assertion may seem surprising, considering the quantity and the quality of what, at least since Plato, and especially over the last few centuries, has been provided by reflection in this domain. However, the essential part of this reflection, except for germinal asides, lightning strokes quickly dying out, moments of the intractable presence of the aporia, has been spent not in opening and broadening the question, but in covering it over as soon as it was discovered, in reducing it as soon as it emerged. The same mechanism and the same motivations are to be found in this covering over and this reduction as in the covering over and the reduction of the question of the imagination and the imaginary and for the same profound reasons. On one hand, inherited reflection has never succeeded in separating out the true object of this question, and in considering it for its own sake, this object has almost always been split into a society, referred to something other than itself, and generally to a norm, end, or telos, grounded in something else, and a history, considered as something that happened to this society, as a disturbance in relation to a given norm, or as an organic or dialectical development towards this norm, end, or telos. In this way, the object in question, the being proper to the social historical, is constantly shifted towards something other than itself and absorbed by this something else. The most profound views, those that are truest with respect to the social historical, those have the those that have taught us the most, and without which we would still be babbling incoherently, these are still implicitly governed by an elsewhere, and this too appertains to the essence and the history of thought. It is in the direction of this elsewhere that these rules attempt to orient what they do say about the social historical. What rules a terjo, inherited reflection upon society and history, that in spite of which it discovers but it does manage to discover, is, for example, the place of society and of history in the divine economy of creation or in the infinite life of reason, or the possibility that they have of encouraging or hampering the individual's fulfillment as an ethical subject, or their standing as the final avatar of natural beings, or the relation of social matter and its corruption or historical instability, its being indefinite, indeterminate, a peron determined by its privation of determinability, its character always becoming ai ginimon, to the form and the norm of the determinate and stable political city, implying the subordination of the study of the former to the requirements of the latter, hence to the right form of the right city, even if one must then deny its very possibility. Thus, too, representation, imagination, and imaginary have never been seen for themselves, but always in relation to something else, to sensation, intellection, perception, or reality, submitted to the normativity incorporated in the inherited ontology, brought within the viewpoint of the true and the false, instrumentalized within a function, means judged according to their possible contribution to the accomplishment of the end that is the truth or access to true being, the being of being, ontos own. In this way, finally, there has not been the slightest concern with knowing what making slash doing means, what the being of making slash doing is, and what it is that making slash doing makes be. So obsessed have people been with these questions alone. What is it to do good or to do well, to do evil or to do badly? Making slash doing has not been thought because no one has attempted to think of anything other than two particular moments of making slash doing, the ethical moment and the technical moment. And even these moments have not been truly thought since that of which they are the moments was never thought and since their very substance has been eliminated from the outset when doing as making be was ignored and when it was subordinated to its partial determinations which are the products of making slash doing but were presented as absolutes reigning from an elsewhere good and evil of which the efficient and the inefficient are derivatives Moreover, reflection on history and society has always been situated on the terrain and within the boundaries of the inherited logic ontology, and how could it have been otherwise? Society and history cannot be the objects of reflection if they are not. 
But what are they? How are they? In what sense are they? The classical rule enjoins, do not multiply beings unnecessarily. At a deeper level lies another rule. Do not multiply the meanings of being. Being must have a single meaning. This meaning, determined from start to finish as determinacy, peras in the Greeks, bestimheit in Hegel, already in itself excluded the possibility of recognizing a type of being that essentially escapes determinacy, like the social historical or the imaginary. Consequently, whether or not it is it recognized this, whether or not it intended this, and even in the instances when it may have been explicitly intended the opposite, inherited thought has necessarily been led to reduce the social historical to the primitive types of being it knew or thought it knew, having constructed them and hence determined them from elsewhere, making the social historical a variant, a combination, or a synthesis of the corresponding beings, thing, subject, idea, or concept. Consequently, too, society and history found themselves subordinated to already guaranteed logical operations and functions that apparently could be thought by means of categories established in fact to grasp a few entities, themselves particular but posited by philosophy as universal. These are but two aspects of the same movement, two indissociable effects of imposing the inherited logic ontology on the social historical. If the social historical is thinkable by means of the categories that are valid for other beings, then it cannot help but be essentially homogeneous within them. Its mode of being poses no particular question, and it allows itself to be reabsorbed within total being. Reciprocally, if to be means to be determined, then society and history are only to the extent that their place within the total order of being, as the result of causes, as means to an end, or as moment in a process, their internal order, and the necessary relation between the two are determined. These orders, relations, and necessities take the form of categories, that is to say, of determinations of all that can be in as much as it can be, thought. The best that can be obtained this way the best that can be obtained this way is the Hegelian Marxist view of society and of history, the sum and sub sequence of actions, whether conscious or not, of a multiplicity of subjects determined by necessary relations and by means of which a system of ideas is embodied by an ensemble of things, or reflects it. Whatever in effective history appears as irreducibly in excess or in deficit in relation to this schema becomes scoria, illusion, contingency, chance, in short, unintelligible. This is not scandalous in itself, but it should be so for a philosophy for which the unintelligible is only another name for the impossible. However, if we decide to consider the social historical for its own sake, if we understand that it is to be questioned and reflected upon starting, starting from itself, if we refuse to eliminate the questions it poses by subjecting it in advance to determinations that we know or believe we know from elsewhere, then we observe that it shatters the inherent logic and ontology. For, we see that it does not fall under traditional categories, except in a nominal and empty manner, that, instead, it makes us recognize the narrow limits of their validity, and that it permits us to glimpse a new and different logic, and, above all, to alter radically the meaning of being. Possible Types of Traditional Responses the question, what is the social historical, joins together the two questions that tradition and convention traditionally separate, that of society and that of history. A brief study of the status of traditional responses will be facilitated by formulating the core of these two questions in a more specific way. What is society? In particular, what are the unity and identity a chaiety, of a society or what holds a society together? What is history? In particular, how and why is there temporal alteration in a society? In what way is this, alter is this an alteration? Is there emergence of the new in history, and what does this emergence signify? The meaning and unity of these questions can be further clarified if we ask ourselves, in what way and why are there many societies and not just one? In what way and why are there differences between societies? If we were to reply that the differences between societies and their histories are merely apparent, the question would still remain just as before. Why then do we find this appearance? Why does the identical appear as different? 
The countless replies given since reflection originated on these two questions can be grouped under two basic types and their various mixtures. The first type of reply is the physicalist type, which reduces directly or indirectly, immediately or in the final analysis, society and history to nature. This nature is, first of all, human biological nature. It matters little whether this is seen to be reducible, in turn, to a simple physical mechanism, or whether it is held to go beyond the latter, for example, a generic being, Gattungweisen, for the young Marx, a Hegelian concept representing a later stage in the logico-ontological elaboration of the fusus of the Aristotelian living being, the aspect-slash-species, eidos, that reproduces itself without ever changing. Functionalism is the purest and most typical exemplar of this point of view. It takes human needs as fixed and explains social organization as the ensemble of functions intended to satisfy these needs. This explanation, as we saw above, explains nothing at all. A host of activities in every society fills no specific function in the functionalist sense, and, what is more, the very question that matters, that concerning differences between societies, is eliminated or, eliminated or covered over by platitudes. The alleged explanation is left hanging in midair for a lack of a stable point to which it could relate the functions that social organization is supposed to serve. This stable point can be supplied only by postulating an identity of human needs. In all societies and in all historical periods, an identity contradicted by the most superficial look at history. One is then forced to resort to the fiction of an inalterable core of abstract needs that would receive from place to place different specifications or vary varying modes of satisfaction and to platitudes or tautologies in order to account for this difference and variability. The essential fact is thereby covered over. Human needs, to the extent that they are social and not simply biological, are inseparable from their objects, and both these needs and their objects are each time instituted by the society considered. The same is true with respect to the impostures propagated nowadays. Ever since desire has become the fashion, society is, in fact, reduced to desire and to its repression without any effort to explain the difference between the objects and the forms of desire, without expressing any surprise at the strange division into desire and the desire for the representation of desire, which is, according to them, supposed to characterize most societies, the possibility of this division and the reasons for its appearance. The second type is the logicist type, which takes on different forms depending on the acceptation of the log dash root in this term log. When the logic log, when the logic in question ultimately amounts, irrespective of its surp surface complications, to arranging a finite number of black and white pebbles in a predetermined number of boxes following a few simple rules, for example, no more than n pebbles of the same color in the same line or column, we have the most impoverished form of logicism, structuralism. The same logical operation, repeated a certain number of times, is thereby held to account for the totality of human history and for the different forms of society. The latter would then be no more than different possible combinations of a finite number of the same discrete elements. This elementary combination combinatorics, which mobilizes the same intellectual fa faculties as those used in constructing magic squares or solving crossword puzzles, must each time unquestionably take for granted both the finite set ensemble of elements on which the operations are performed and the oppositions or differences it postulates between them. However, even in phonology, of which structuralism is but an abusive extrapolation, one cannot take as a basis the natural givenness of a finite set of discrete elements. Here, the phonemes are distinctive features that can be uttered and perceived by man, as Plato already knew, sounds that are uttered and perceived as indeterminate, aperion and peros, determination, the simultaneous positing of phonemes and of their relevant d differences, is an institution of language, long, in general, and of each specific tongue, long, this institution and its differences, the differences between French phono phonolo phonology and English phonology, for example, phonology accepts as a fact and is not obliged to answer. As a positive and limited form of knowledge, it can leave the question of the origin of its object dormant. How could one proceed in the same way when the question of society and of history is, essentially, a question of the nature and the origin of differences? Structuralism's naivete in this respect is 
disarming. It has nothing to say about the sets of elements it manipulates, about the reasons for their being thus, or about their modifications in time. Masculine and feminine, north and south, high and low, dry and wet, seem self-evident to structuralism, simply found there by humans, stones of meaning scattered on the earth since the origins, in a being thus which at once is completely natural and totally significant, among which each society selects a few, following the game of chance provided that it can choose elements only by pairs of opposites and that the choice of certain pairs leads to or excludes the choice of others. As if social organization could be reduced to a finite sequence of yes slash no, and as if wherever a yes slash no is involved, the terms it bears upon were themselves given from somewhere else and from all time, whereas they are, in terms and as these particular terms, the creation of the society concerned. Or else, at the extreme opposite end, and in its richest form, the logic employed claims to stir all the figures of the material and spiritual universe. Accepting no limit, it wants to and has to bring everything into play, into relation with everything else, into complete determinacy and exhaustive reciprocal determination. It must then generate them, it must generate them some on the basis of others and all on the basis of the fir same first or last element as its necessary figures or moments, necessarily unfolding in a necessary order of which the logic itself must necessarily be a part as a reflecting on, reflecting back, repetition or apex. No matter whether this element is termed reason, as in Hegelianism, matter or nature, as in the canonical version of Marxism, matter or nature that, in principle, is reducible to rational determinations, we have already indicated a few of the countless and indeterminable aporias to which this conception leads. Thus, the question of the unity and identity of society, of an, uh, and of any particular society, is brought back to the assertion of a given unity and identity of an ensemble of living organisms, or of a hyperorganism containing its own needs and functions, or of a natural logical group of elements, or of a system of rational determinations. Of society as such in all this, there remains nothing, nothing that might be the proper being of society, nothing that manifests a mode of being any different from what we already know from elsewhere. Nor does there remain much of history of the temporal alteration produced in and through society. Faced with the question of history, physicalism naturally becomes causalism, that is, the elimination of the question. For the question of history is the question of the emergence of radical alterity or the, of the absolutely new. Even the assertion of the contrary would attest to this, for neither amoeba nor galaxies talk in order to say that everything is eternally the same. And causality is always the negation of alterity, the positing of a double identity, an identity in the repetition of the same, causes. And causality is always the negation of alterity. The positing of a double identity, an identity in the repetition of the same causes producing the same effects, an ultimate identity of the cause and the effect since each necessarily belongs to the other or both to the same. It is therefore not by chance that the preeminent element in and through which the social historical unfolds, namely significations, is neglected or else transformed into a mere epiphenomenon a redundant accompaniment to what is really supposed to be happening. How indeed could one be could one signification be the cause of another signification, and how could they be the effects of non-significations? Precisely the same elimination of the question of history is brought about by the form that logicism takes, becoming, in the face of history, rationalistic finalism. For, if logicism sees in significations the element of history, it is incapable of considering these significations other than as rational. This, of course, does not imply that it must posit them as conscious for the agents of history. But rational significations can and must be deduced or produced on the basis of other rational significations. Their unfolding is then no more than a spreading out, and the new is each time constructed through identitary operations, even if they are termed dialectical, by means of what was already there. The totality of the process is only the displaying of the necessarily realized virtualities inherent in a primordial principle present for all time and for all time. Historical time thus becomes a simple abstract medium of successive coexistence or a mere receptacle for the dialectical sequences. 
true time, the time of radical alterity, an alterity that can be neither deduced nor produced, has to be abolished, and no reason other than the contingent reason can explain why the totality of past and future history is not, in principle, deducible. The end of history annoys Hegel's commentators because it seems absurd to them to situate it in 1930. This displays insufficient knowledge of the necessities of the philosopher's thought, for which this end had already occurred before the beginning of history. For history cannot be reason if it does not have a raison d'etre, that in its end, telos, that is, just as necessarily fixed for it, form all time, as the paths of its progress. This is simply another way of saying that time is abolished, as it is in every true teleology, since, for every complete and necessary teleology, everything is controlled from the end, and the end is already posited and determined at the start of the process, positing and determining the means that will make it appear as accomplished. Time is then only a pseudonym for the order of positing and of reciprocal generation of the terms of the process, or, as effective time, mere external condition that has nothing to do with the process itself. I have already indicated, in many texts, that canonical Marxism represents an attempt to glue back together the causalist and the finalist view. Let us note that, beyond the contingent incapacity of the exponents of structuralism to confront the problems of history, apart from denying more or less explicitly that such a problem exists, nothing would prevent one from positing the fiction of a structure of history in its temporal unfolding, or, rather, that the postulate of a structure such as this would be required by a structuralist conception that desired to be self-consistent. Actually, structuralism cannot be taken seriously as a general conception so long as it does not venture to affirm that the different social structures it claims to describe are themselves simply elements of a hyper or metastructure that would constitute total history. And since this would amount to bringing history to a close, as far as ideas are concerned, speaking of structures means nothing unless all the elements and their relations can be determined once and for all, and to placing oneself in the spot of absolute knowledge, structuralism cannot be taken seriously in this case either.